Across the wide and lonesome prairie, the Oregon Trail Diary of Hattie Campbell, pages 69 through 77, written by Christiana Gregory, read by Christina Grieve. Next day, wet blankets were hung to dry inside the wagons and outside pinned to the canvas. They were, they soon were so full of trail dust that it was a chore to shake the mud loose. Tall Joe says last night was just a dribble, nothing compared to the heavy rains he's seen in years past. So we should shut up and count ourselves lucky. When word spread that Gideon and Pepper planned to marry, the women began putting together a wedding chest for them. Aunt June emptied one of her trunks and began folding and packing gifts that folks brought. A beautiful down quilt came from one family. There was bed sheets and linens, a tarp, a lantern, and a Dutch oven, an axle, and a kettle. I gave her my tin of Babbitt's powdered soap. One lady brought over her own lace nightgown and petticoat, never worn, that she'd been saving to wear once she got to Oregon. May as well have a bride. Enjoy them now, she said. Oregon is a long way off and who knows what'll happen between now and then. Peppa and Gideon take long walks in the evening, then appear in time for the last dance. They hold hands until the fire's low. She's late crawling into our bed and I wake up to her whispering in my ear, Hattie, for a while, we watch the stars and talk, and I wonder about the mysteries of marriage. But I worry, will she still be my friend? Will we live next door to each other like we planned? Later, I am ashamed of myself. Today, the fat lady came over to visit, but Ma was down by the creek. I was figuring on how to act busy when the lady said, Hello, honey. I made some taffy for you to share with your brothers. Here you go. She handed me the candy wrapped in oil cloth and smiled at me so kindly. I felt ashamed that I had avoided her so. Right quick, I invited her to tea. Recollecting Aunt June having told me to be hospitable. While the kettle was set over the fire to boil, the lady went to her wagon and came back with her husband riding on her wide shoulders. They introduced themselves as Mr. and Mrs. Big. Cross my heart, I did not laugh at their name. Mrs. Big said she has to drive the wagon on account of her husband being crippled. He sits next to her to keep her company. And now I recall seeing them talk and laugh together hour after hour like old friends. Because he has no legs and the trail is so rough, he ties himself to the bench so he won't bounce off. They said that a few years ago, he was trampled by horses from a runaway wagon and his crushed legs had to be amputated. Poor man. I've decided that they are two of the nicest folks I ever did meet. And I will strike anyone who makes fun of them or the fact that their name, that her name describes her. I'm so glad I kept my first opinions to myself. If Peppa knew how unkind I could be, I would melt from shame. Later, when Mrs. Big heard that Peppa is to be married, she dug in her trunk and pulled out one of her lace tablecloths. She marched over to our camp, pulling a cart when Mr. Big sits like he's riding in the little train. She held up the lace, she held the lace up to Peppa and said, honey, I'm going to make you the prettiest wedding dress you will ever set eyes on. And she did. For five evenings, Mrs. Big sewed and cut and measured until she had a creamy white dress with long sleeves and a bow that ties at the waist. Mr. Big sat beside her in his cart sewing too. He made a lacy overskirt from curtains that had hung in their parlor back in Missouri. Finally, we gathered by her wagon and held up the blankets to make a private room. Peppa carefully stepped into the dress as her mother buttoned up the back. The ladies caught their breaths. 
She looks so beautiful. A hot afternoon. Mrs. Anderson came over this morning as we were packing up our breakfast plates. She looks very thin, but there's more color to her cheeks. I can hardly look at her without wanting to cry for little Cassia. She said to Ma, oh, it was so warm last night. I think, I think I left my shawl by your fire. Have you seen it, Augusta? Together they looked under the wagon, by the crates and stools, then in Aunt June's wagon. I remember it was a pretty blue shawl with fringe. We looked and looked. Wade is feeling good enough to dance, but when, when the fiddler started up, he asked another girl. I was so upset I ran outside the circle where it was dark. For a long time, I sat in the dirt where no one could see me, watching the dances. I felt so alone. I want someone to love me the way Gideon loves Peppa. Mid-June. The North Platte River runs west, but now we've come to where it makes a sharp turn to the south. We must cross it in order to continue to Oregon. Imagine our surprise to see that the Mormons not only had come and gone, but left behind nine men to build a ferry, two ferries, and they would be glad to help us get across for just a do for just a dollar fifty per wagon. My argument, the, my, the arguments that broke out because of this. Tall Joe said that over his dead body, would he pay one penny to cross a river that he saw years before Brigham Young even knew it existed. But Pa said, I think it's mighty enterprising of the Mormons to start a business in such a faraway place. Mr. and Mrs. Kanka cussed something fierce, thinking they might need to part with some of their money. Several families said this. Those Mormons are so high and mighty, they stayed on the other side of the river and wouldn't associate with us. But now they can make a dollar fifty. Now that they can make a dollar off us, they're friendly as can be. Come on, folks, Pa said. Brigham Young's people are trying to start a new life just like us. And I'll tell you something else. We ain't their judge. God Almighty is. So let's get going and not be so mad about everything. He and Uncle Tim bargained with the Mormons. Two sacks of cornmeal paid our passage across on rafts made from thin logs and strips of leather. Each raft, they said, could hold up to 1,800 pounds. <sighs> but I don't know. It felt unsteady, and water washed over my face as I helped Ma hold the wagon. I was so scared we'd, we'd sink. My knees ached from standing stiff. The littlest children sat safe inside, real still, so the wagon wouldn't rock. Pa and Uncle Tim swam with the animals, my little brother on the back of a mule. The water came up to his waist, but his fingers were hooked right tight into the harness. I kept an eye on him, ready to dive in if he should slip off. Once our family and the Andersons were all safe across the deep river, I was not so nervous. It took six days to get everyone over. Ma refused to pay the Mormons and instead, oh, many refused to pay the Mormons and instead forded the river with, without help. Except for wet belongings and scared children, everything was all right until the last day when we heard screams. I looked out and there in the middle of the current was two wagons side by side, their mules swimming hard, their big brown heads straining for breath. Somehow, one of the mules drifted downstream into the other team and got its hooves tangled in the harnesses. That poor mule panicked. Then, right before our eyes, the animals began to drown. They sank so fast that, that, that they pulled the wagons underwater before anyone had a chance to jump out. Two families disappeared just like that. I am sick at heart. The screams of their friends on shore, I will never forget, as long as I live. But one day the men searched for bodies, while the last of the families came over. Meanwhile, everyone stayed busy doing regular things, almost like nothing bad had happened. Pa said the nine Mormons will take apart their wagon, their wagons to build a cabin, then stay till more pioneers come out next summer. This gave Pa and Mr. Lewis an idea. Soon enough, they had bartered wood to make a small wagon with three hoops. They bought a, bought a tent 
and with the help of Mr. and Mrs. Biggs, sewing turned the canvas into a top. They traded beans for two mules with harnesses and, and neck collars. What on earth? asked Ma. There stood a miniature prairie schooner, about five feet long and three feet wide, with one set of wheels. Mr. Lewis grinned, and he answered, It's a wedding gift for my daughter and Gideon. Pa made friends with one of the Mormons, a man named Appleton M. Harmon, and they got to talking about something. Brigham Young and his men invented on the trail to measure in miles. It's called a rotometer. He drew Pa a picture in the sand. It looks like four or five wooden cogs attached to a wagon wheel. Somehow it works. The Mormons also have something like a thermometer that measures barometric pressure, barometric pressure. This is uh, how they know the altitude. 